Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. It Floats, written by Deomek. May Meany smiled at the green-scaled alien, gesturing for him to have a seat. His bulbous eyes stared back at her with the kind of mild understanding that only paper pushers could have. Miss Meany, it is a pleasure to meet you said the alien's translating device in perfect BBC English. Dr. Meany, actually, she continued, smiling. And the pleasure is all mine, Captain uh, Slavery. He blinked. You are a healer? No, I have a doctorate in economics. Hence why she was working out the kinks of integrating the Earth's economy with the galactic empires. The title of doctor is used for both healers and those who have attained a certain degree of education. Understood. My apologies. The Silvervi pulled out a thin metal device, his uniform, and placed it on the table. Shall we begin? Of course. Now, how do you humans exchange goods and services? The captain tapped the device, and a hologram and three galaxies flickered into existence. After a murmured command in a different, sibilant language, the image abruptly changed to that of Earth. Do note that everything you say will be recorded. May smile faded slightly. Well, um... We usually have a, a currency. You have a currency, he interrupted. Excellent. That'll be much easier to integrate with the barter-based system. What is your currency based on? It was the doctor's turn to stare. Based on? Yes. What backs your currency? Silberby was already tapping away at the holographic keyboard in an unconcerned fashion. Well, they said, pursing her lips. We have several currencies, but... He's typing slowed. That will be a bit more difficult, but it can still be managed. Are they all backed by different substances? No, um, they're even better. Since Earth has much water, I assume that's what backs it. Or does your kind have a different substance of choice? Hopefully it is a compound or an element. But even if it's not, we can continue regardless. The captain's thin tail thumped once against the table. They're not backed by anything. He stopped. But... I do not understand. Elaborate. Most of our currencies are, are free-floating. He blinked again, this time slowly. Your money floats. No, I mean... She tried to keep her exasperation from her voice. May hadn't expected to explain basic economics to a fellow bureaucrat who managed the intergalactic economy. Well, we used to have currency backed by gold. So it is backed by gold. Why did you not say this earlier? Silvervi's tail smacked against the floor in relief. The alien went back to typing. It's, uh, not backed by gold anymore. We dissolved that system, uh, decades ago. She ran her fingers through her hair. Now, um, but why? He blinks began to increase in frequency. If you let me finish, I can explain it to you. She took a deep breath. We stopped using the gold standard for several reasons. One being the lack of gold in comparison to the economy. We couldn't control inflation with the amount of gold we had. Then why did you not get more gold? The hologram zoomed out, showing an asteroid belt. He pointed with his tail. There is a large amount of gold in the planetoids orbiting your sun. You have had space travel capable of reaching these asteroids for many decades. Yes, sir. But we had loosened our ties with the gold decades before that and, uh... May cut herself off, uh, th That's besides the point, um... I'm sure that you're not interested in a history lesson. Why don't we go back to deciding how our currency... We can't do that without knowing what your currency is worth. What is it based on? The captain's pupil shrank slightly. What is it based on? He repeated. It's uh, not based on anything. It, it floats. What does it float on? Said Silvervi helplessly. What is it based on? What determines its value? It doesn't float on anything. It's backed by the government... And the markets determine its value in comparison to other currencies. She gritted her teeth. Then what does the government base it on? He asked. If the government backs it, then what does the government use to determine its value? Uh, the, the government issues the currency, but it doesn't determine the value. She massaged her forehead. The, the markets determine the... Then what is it based on? He shouted, leaping to his feet. It isn't based on anything. She slammed her hands against the table. It's just paper! The captain relaxed. Oh, so it's based on paper. 
The next three minutes of recording show Dr. Maimini and Captain Severby screaming profanities at each other. The green alien huddled in the corner of the room, shivering in the fetal position. It floats, whimpered Severby. May stood on the table, panting in triumph. It floats! After that little outburst, both of them calmed down and resumed negotiations. The alien exhaled in one long, continuous hiss. So your currency is made of paper that represents a value determined by the markets, yes. But, May hesitated, should she mention it? The doctor didn't want to send him into an existential crisis again. Then again, it was the integration of Earth's economy, so he had to know. Most money doesn't actually exist. His tail wrapped around the leg of the table. What? Elaborate. She raised her head high and prepared herself. You see, um, a great deal of our currency exists in banks. So it does exist. The captain was preparing himself to... His tail was coiled around the table so tightly that she could hear the wood creak. If it exists in banks, that's where you store the paper. Yes, uh, but it isn't stored as paper. It's stored as numbers, she said quickly, all in one breath before he could interrupt her. Numbers? The plaintive note in his voice was highlighted by the squeak of the wood. You count the paper and put it in as numbers. Uh, there isn't any paper, May explained. It's just numbers that could become paper if... The leg broke. Now you're telling me there, there isn't even any paper. He brandished the wooden stump. Dr. Meany stood up and grabbed a chair. You're damn right I am. Now sit down and shut the hell up. She bared her teeth at him, eyes wide. Don't make me explain Bitcoin to you. Zivervi cringed and sat back down. End of story. Story number two. Sacrificial Breath, written by Big Wuffle. They had been adrift for five days now. The meager engines on the small life shuttle were only much use for getting to the nearest habitable planet, and not much else. Not for the first time. The inhabitants cursed the captain for the small passenger ferry for trying to cut corners, literally, between the carefully mapped out and, above all, safe hopping lanes. Now they were stuck, deep in the black with no comm buoy in their fuel non-existent. The five survivors huddled with a cool interior, having long ago set the life support to a bare minimum in an attempt to squeeze out a little more power to the engines. Four had taken to almost obscene means in a bid to preserve what little heat was left between them. The unfortunate fifth, in his life support suit, off to the side after setting his private breathable tank as low as it could go without outright unconsciousness. And even then... He was drifting in and out of lucidness at random. The silence was broken by a startling loud chime from the computer. The smallest disentangled himself with complaints all around as to the cool bite into their skin and scales. It's a ship. The armored one rose his head, white strong if wheezing a little, despite his swaying. One of his more alert moments, it seems. Oh, way. Close, but they aren't looking in our direction. The largest adjusted his grip on the remaining two to try and keep the warmth closer to the core of the tangled ball of limbs, grinding softly. No beacons, sirens, flares. Now we have are the engines. The heat spike would draw the attention, but, uh... The group sagged, almost in union. They all knew that the fuel tank was on fumes at best. Nowhere near enough, even for a two-second burn. The fifth, however... Straightened up, grabbed onto the wall to help himself to his feet. Where... <clears throat> where do they, uh, refuel this thing? The four exchanged glances, sadly tilting the heads or freaking ears as signs of unspoken agreement. He must have gone back into this lack of atmosphere delusions. It was kinder to let him believe what he wanted, for now. There's an emergency intake behind you, but... He fell silent looking away as the bipedal started scrabbling amongst the panels behind him with more energy than he'd seen for days. He was probably using up more of his precious, breathable atmosphere in a frenzied searching, crying out its success as a small connecting valve was exposed. The four returned to their huddle, averting the gaze. The life support indicator was barely above zero now, and even they were starting to feel the thinness of the air. So when the hoarse voice croaked out a command to the computer, 
had responded. No one had any idea what happened. The engines burned for a full, solid five seconds, propelling them moderately towards the possible rescue before winking out. The heat from the engines captured and shunted into the capsule like a rejuvenating wind, stirring them from the edges of cold-induced hibernation. After that, things tended to blur together. A sudden heat bloom was significant enough to warrant investigation, and with far more powerful and fully fueled engines than search ship located them within minutes. After that, it was a swirl of thermal blankets, IV drips, and sweet argon puffed into their faces through small, badly fitting masks. It was only a few hours later that one of the surviving thought to ask about the myth. Why wasn't he recovering along with them? A few hours after asking a passing nurse, the four were standing outside the morgue, slightly dazed, and asking the doctor to repeat himself. Not unkindly, he lowered the shutter, hiding the bald, pink body from the view as it had been removed from its suit. They are a recent discovered race. Their native atmosphere is a, uh, let's say, volatile mix of gases, including hydrogen and oxygen. The four processed that slowly, trying to wrap their heads around it. They breathe fuel. The doctor nodded, referring to his pad. Impossibly, yes. We had to look at his tank when he brought him on board. He had another five days worth in storage. By getting any noticeable activity from the engines, he had to shunt every breath into the engines. Without that, there's no telling when he would be found, if ever. The four pressed against each other subconsciously, ears folding and frills droopy. He could have outlasted them all but chose to give them a solid chance of survival instead. The smallest looked over at the shuttered window and whispered, unable to raise his voice higher. Who was he? His name? Hit people? There is no way of knowing until we find the ship manifest, but I can tell you his species. Human. End of story. This is a special thank you to the one, the only, the legendary Erak Hino, who has become the only Tier 6 patron. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps, Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.